You're listening to episode seven of the Journey to Launch podcast, how to negotiate a $25,000 raise and navigate the corporate world. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 guys. Thanks once again for joining me. If you are rejoining me, <laughs> if you are a first time listener, thank you for checking out the podcast. I can't believe we are up to episode seven already. This is kind of crazy. <laughs> this has been such an amazing ride thus far. And I want to just thank you again for joining me on it. Before we get into today's episode, which is really what I believe to be very important. So I've been referencing why income is such an important metric driving force in the wealth formula. And so today's podcast talks about how you can increase your income. Now, my guest, Dorian St. Floor from Your Career Girl, and we'll get into her bio and everything a little bit later, but she focuses on how to increase your income through a corporate career. And while if you're listening to this, if you're in a corporate career, I know that you'll get some great tips from this. But even if you're not working in a corporate career, you can find some really good tidbits about just general conversations that you can have with your boss, no matter what industry, on how to ask for a raise and demand your worth. And so before we get into that, I just want to give a little backstory, because if you are listening to this in real time, that means that right now I am in Anaheim, California for podcast movement. So if you listen to episode one, you'll kind of understand my background and why I started this podcast. It's crazy because I'm at podcast movement and I didn't even know I was going to be at podcast movement two weeks ago. So let me step back. I started the podcast because I wanted to impact someone's life, even if it was just one person the way that podcasts have impacted my life because it was a podcast, it was podcast with an S that I started listening to that really inspired me to figure out a plan to retire early. And when I started out to make the podcast, I saw that there was an event called Podcast Movement, which is the leading industry event for podcasters. And I said to myself, wow, this looks like a really good event. I saw that it was in California, but I wasn't sure that it was right for me at the moment because I believe when I first saw it, it was before I even had the podcast out. And I said to myself, you know what? I'll go to this next year. If I am still doing this podcast next year, I will be at Podcast Movement, wherever it is. And I kind of put it on the back burner. And it just so happened that because I'm a part of the FinCon community, so I'm going to FinCon for the first time in October, and I'm in the Facebook group and I saw a post that said, hey, from PT. So PT is the founder of FinCon. He has his own blog and he posted in the FinCon community. Hey, are there any new podcasters who'd like to go to podcast movement? And me being who I am, I basically just jumped on the opportunity and said, you know what? I'm a new podcaster. I think he's talking to me. So I immediately sent him an email, not really understanding or knowing what was really involved or even understanding like the flights that I would need to get. But I just jumped on it. And it just so happened that he graciously gave me and a couple other people tickets to come to Podcast Movement. And for exchange to the tickets, I'm going to help out at the FinCon booth, which I'm really excited about. And I'll get to meet so many um, people. And so for me, like this whole process of why I'm even here right now, it's crazy. It shows me how when things are for you, they are for you. And why you just got to flow 
with life, with what life gives you. And I'm just really excited to be here. I'm actually going to be recording a live podcast episode here, which I'm not sure when that will come out. Maybe it'll be next week's podcast, but I'm just excited. I mean, I just can't believe that just all these opportunities are happening. And I want to kind of relay that to just the journey in general, because I feel like There are going to be things that happen for you, for me on a continual basis that kind of give us signs that we're on the right path. And they might not always be blatant. You know, they might not always be in black and white where you know what it's saying. But I think you usually can tell if you're on the right path from how you feel. And so even if it's taking you a long time or things are not progressing the way you'd like to on your journey, the way you feel those pockets of happiness, those pockets of feeling like you are going to possibly reach your goals, those are signs. And I want you to, the negativity, the doubt that we actually talked about in the last episode, I want you to not focus on that. I want you to focus on the positives and what's going right for you. So I'm just really blessed and excited that I have this opportunity to be here. And if you follow me on IG or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you'll probably see me doing some live post about my experience at Podcast Movement, but I will definitely do a follow-up episode or maybe the one that I record at Podcast Movement. I'll talk more about the conference itself. I don't know. We'll see. So let's get into today's episode. So today's episode with Dorian St. Floor, the Your Career Girl Strategic, is very special. Dorian is actually one of my closest friends. And not only is she a close friend, but she is my biz bestie. And I feel like not only can I feel like I can come to her on a personal level, but on a career and a professional level, she has been an influencer, a supporter of Journey to Launch, and I'm just so grateful for her. So she comes on the podcast to talk about so much great information. And Dory Ann negotiated a $25,000 salary increase for herself that blew my mind when I first heard about it. And I asked her in this interview to talk more about that, to talk about the specific strategies that she used to be able to do that. We talk about how to know if you're getting paid what you're worth and how to have that conversation with your boss if you don't feel like you're getting paid what you're worth. We talk about specific strategies to ask for a raise and how LinkedIn can really, really change the game for you. I think you'll get a lot of great tips from this podcast. Again, if if you're not in the corporate world, I think this will be something you can gain some knowledge from. If you want to see the episode show notes, please go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode seven. And you'll be able to find everything that we talk about or reference in the show notes. And before I forget, If you are listening to this podcast on iTunes, please review, rate, and subscribe. As you know, I really appreciate all the reviews and subscriptions I get through iTunes. It really helps the podcast out, and I just can't tell you enough how much it means to me. Stick around for the end of this episode. I'm going to be reading another review that I got on iTunes. All right, let's go. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. I have one of my first inaugural guests here with me today. Her name is no other than, (laughs) I like how you jumped in fast. Her name is Dorianne St. Floor. She is your career girl and she's one of actually one of my best friends and business besties. So Dorianne, welcome to the podcast. Yay! I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so, so much for having me. Sure. And so just a little background, guys. So not only is Dorianne a career expert, salary negotiating expert, because we're going to talk about income in this episode because it's so important in building wealth and we'll get into that. But Dorianne is just an amazing person, right? Like that's why she's my friend. (laughs) (laughs) And we've known each other for a very long time. And our kids are even besties. Our kids are both, what, a week apart? Two weeks apart. The oldest ones? Yeah. And that was not planned. Oh, yes. I was just about to say that. We did not plan that, people. This is God's work. Right. But 
I'm saying all that to say, you know, I know Dorian very well. I've seen her transition from different jobs and different careers and accelerate her income, right? Like there've been times where we've been on the phone or she comes back and says, well, I just got, I don't know. What was the biggest, I guess, raise in income that you've gotten? The biggest salary increase I got was 25,000. Right. So I've seen her use her own tips and strategies in her own life to earn her more money. And I'm, I've always been amazed. So I'm so happy to have her on to kind of talk us through, us journeyers through how we can maximize our income, how we can earn more and live a better work-life balance while on our journey. So your career girl, Dorian, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your platform. Yes. Um, as you said, Dorian, I am the creator of yourcareergirl.com, which is basically an online boutique career coaching agency where I specialize in really helping women transform their careers, if I had to boil it down to one sentence. So I focus on you know, teaching women how to make more money, how to have more impact, how to really do things that they love. And I do that through blog posts, through co- personal coaching, through group coaching, through online courses. You name it, I do it. But my goal is really just female empowerment through career development. That's awesome. And as I mentioned before, I like to look at building wealth through the wealth equation. And this is how I describe it. It's your income minus your expenses equals the gap. And what you do with the gap is how you build wealth. And so whether you have a lot of debt and you want to use that gap to pay off debt, you know, that's one way you can use it. Or if you want to use that gap to invest and to increase your wealth, that's another way to use it. But the question then becomes, how do you create a wider gap? And so there are two ways. There's increasing your income or decreasing your expenses. And I know we talk a lot on Journey to Launch about decreasing expenses and keeping your expenses manageable, but the income is the driving force of the equation. Like if you get that right, and you don't screw up on the expenses, you'll be able to accelerate yourself to wealth. And so that's why I think it's so important that we here talk about that. And so I want you to go into like as a career person, someone who is in a job getting, who's an employee, Mm -hmm. how can they understand if they're getting underpaid or not? And this is something that comes up a lot because I think First of all, your point about like the equation and it being multiple sides, I think that is spot on. And a lot of times when I'm speaking to women, yes, what they're talking about making more money, but the reason why they want to make more money is like you said, they want to pay off debt and they want to live life more, you know, abundantly. So all of these things definitely work together. And one of the first steps is yes, to figure out, am I even being underpaid? And the way that you need to do that is really, you need to do your research. So many people, they don't research where they are in relation to the market. So when I say, the market, I mean everybody else that is doing a similar role to you or who is, you know, similar years of experience. And believe it or not, that information is out there. This is 2017. And as we move into 18, 19, and just so on and so forth, we're going to have access to so much information. So there are sites like glassdoor.com, there's LinkedIn, there's straight up Google, like there are so many ways to find out what the going rate is for your role. And the first step is to do your research. Literally go in to Glassdoor is a great place to start. Type in your role, you know, look at the region you're in, what state, if you're in NYC, there's a different pay rate from being in Minnesota. Just look at, you know, what the going rate is and start to get and you're not just taking one figure, you're taking multiple data points and start to get what that range is or what the average is and really start to think about, okay, so where am I in relation to what the market says I should be? And when I go through this exercise with people, a lot of people are surprised at how underpaid they are, but they're also surprised that they're not as underpaid as they thought or that you know they were kind of just way off base. So it's a good starting point just to figure out where am I actually, where am I being even being underpaid and you need to do your research. So Glassdoor is one doing going on the internet. Another way is to speak to professionals in the industry. So speak Mm -hmm. to career coaches, speak to recruiters. They're the ones on the front lines and they know, they know like what's going on, but I have a question. So I still feel like talking about income is a little taboo. And so the secrecy or the tabooness, if that's a word Mm -hmm. behind it, sometimes keeps you in the dark and then not able to share. So for example, like in your own company, like I think it would be helpful to know what your neighbor made, but Mm -hmm. you know, that's all private and you can't know that. But I find that probably a lot of people are getting 
less than their neighbor or less than their coworker because Mm -hmm. no one feels comfortable and not like I'm saying people should start sharing their salaries. Mm -hmm. But because people don't talk about it and it's still taboo, it's kind of hard though, like in your own environment, in your own company to understand where you are because people just don't talk about it. You're so right. And one thing I want to say is that, and you know, let's, I wish we could do slow-mo on this so people could really hear what I'm about to say, but it is not illegal to share your salary. So people think that you cannot ask your neighbor or tell your neighbor how much you make. And as an HR person, I'm like breaking the code right now, telling you this, (laughs) but you can definitely ask someone. Now that doesn't take away the fact that it still is taboo. Like if somebody came up to my desk and asked me how much I make, excuse me, excuse me, get out of my face, right? <laughs> like, <don't ask> me. <laughs> but I think though that within your circle outside of work is a great place to ask. Like your friends, I was speaking to someone else and just talking about even within like close people within your family and close friends, like there really should be more transparency so that if someone is in a similar industry from you, most of your friends are probably similar industries or similar years of experience. You guys are kind of around the same page. And if you're making, let's say you're making like 50,000 and then everyone else around you is making like 125,000 and you guys are all on wall street. You guys all graduated the same year, similar backgrounds. What's the problem? What's the difference? And because we're not having these conversations, nobody knows. And I'm still a little bit, you know, kind of hush about it, but I'm trying to get better and I'm trying to be more transparent. But when I started having conversations with my dad and just with other family members and speak, it just really gave me the confidence to really speak up and to share with people. I'm not going to go and ask, I'm going to tell, but if people ask me and we're having a candid conversation, I definitely think we need to remove this stigma around sharing how much you make. Obviously time and place for everything. Obviously know your audience. Obviously you're not going around bragging. No, but in context and when you're trying to help and when you're going through your research, if you can have like a circle of people that you trust and that you can really compare notes with each other and get tips on negotiation and how much did you make and how much was your increase, that really just goes a long way and helps you get to where you need to be. Right. Now, so say you do realize you're being underpaid. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You better ask for more. (laughs) (laughs) But before you walk into your boss's office and talk about, you know, journey to launch and your career girl told me to come in here and ask you for (laughs) money. Don't get fired, guys. Exactly. Because you can't stay with me. So don't get fired. Before you do that, just make sure that you do your research again. Like the reason I feel like a broken record. I'm always telling people to do your research, but again, you need to know what are you asking for? So when you do your research and you find out, okay, so I'm really 10 to $15,000 below market. Now I need to get really serious and come together with a strategy of what I'm going to do. So now you have, you're armed with this information, 10 to 15,000 below. Now talk, think about like what your past performance reviews have been. Think about if you can get some Intel from maybe not people who currently work at your company, but maybe people who used to work at the company. If you can talk to a couple of recruiters. So I'm always telling people that you should always be in some sort of a job search. Even if you're not ready to move, you should have recruiters on speed dial, someone that you can reach out to who's definitely in the market and ask them, you know, how much would I get paid for a role similar to this? If I were applying somewhere else, what's the range of this role? Really get some research so that when you go in with your number or when you go in with your range, you're able to speak to facts. A boss, a manager, HR, I hate when people walk in and say, I'm not being paid enough. Okay, <laughs> how do you know that? How much do you want? What, what are your receipts? Exactly. Like, what, I need- exactly, I need receipts. So let me know like specifically, what does that mean? Where are you thinking? What your expectations are? And it all starts with research. It starts with, you know, researching where you need to be, where you are, where other people are. And then also take an honest look at your own performance. If you're being underpaid, but you've not met expectations for like the past three quarters, I don't know what to tell you, right? Because you're not really doing, you're not operating at a certain level. So are they really going to be that inclined to give you an increase? Any of the increases that I've gotten literally have come on the fact that I have performance to back it up or, and if it was for a new job, then I through the interview process, I explained to them why taking a chance on me was going to help them and value them. And so why they should give me more money. So yeah, speaking and going a little bit further into that, we want to know like the insider HR secrets. So what are some salary negotiating hacks or tricks or secrets for those of us in existing jobs who want to ask for more money or 
for someone who is looking for a job and in that process? And those are two separate processes. So yes, I'll break down each of them. So if you're in an existing job and like it or not, I'm sorry, but you honestly have better chances of getting a larger increase if you're going outside of your company and going to another job than you do being in your current job. And that's just, it's not because people are against the people that are there, but it's just because companies, they're constantly like benchmarking and looking at what their competitors are doing and trying to stay in line and the way they entice people to come in is by offering them more money and just kind of sometimes hurts to be in a company for a long time. People who've been in a company for like five years or more tend to be paid less than people who come from other places. So it's unfortunate, but that is why if you're at a company, you need to stay on top of your salary and you need to stay on top of the conversation and not just be a passive participant in the process. So it still starts out with doing your research. You should don't just take what you're given every year or however often you get a salary increase and say, okay, you know, this is what it is, but do your research as well. So someone with your level of experience doing what you do, how much would they get paid? Again, Go to Glassdoor, go to LinkedIn, talk to people, talk to your recruiters, find out what those numbers are. And then you want to be strategic about how you position this conversation with your boss. So if you know your boss is a person who doesn't like to be blindsided and they want to have an agenda ahead of time and they want to know what these meetings are about, then do that. Don't switch it up for something as something as big as this conversation. So send mm-hmm. them an email that says, hey, I kind of want to talk about my salary or we haven't had a salary conversation in a while before the annual process. I wanted to get some time on your calendar, something like that to let them know this conversation is coming. And then when you go in, it's not the time to beat around the bush. It's not around the time to talk in code. It's about being direct, of course, professional, but direct. I've been doing my research and based on what I'm seeing and based on, you know, I've been talking to people out in the market and it looks like I'm being paid $15,000 less than someone else doing a similar role. How can we get me closer to this? What is it that I need to do? I've done X project and this, and I've done really well. And you guys promoted me, you know, start to, this is the time to brag on yourself. What do I need to do to get to the next level and get that conversation going? You don't ever want to give your boss an ultimatum. You don't ever want to say, you better give me this increase. You know, you, what are you guys doing? You don't ever want to do that because just as uncomfortable and awkward as the conversation is for you, it's also awkward for your boss. You don't want to make it work by making it all crazy. So you want to be professional. You want to have your receipts as well with your boss and you want to ground it in things that you've already done. And the thing that people do is like when the annual conversation is happening, that's when they want to bring up, oh, well, I wanted to get this or I wanted to get that. It's kind of too late at that point. You have to be strategic and be having, this should be an ongoing conversation. You should always be talking about your performance. You should always be talking about what your salary expectations are. You shouldn't be passive and just waiting. You need to be proactive in these conversations. It's a little trickier, again, when you're already in the company, but it definitely can be done. I work with people all the time who they do their research, they raise their points, and maybe they don't get exactly what they're asking for, but they do get something. The statistics are out there that, you know, I don't remember, I'm not going to, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but basically most of the time people who ask the question get something. But 100% of the time, people who don't ask, you get nothing. So it doesn't hurt. The worst that they can say is no or not now or whatever, but you should definitely ask the question. Now, if you are going to a new job, this is the fun. I enjoy the salary negotiation process when you're looking for a new job. It's a game to me. It's like, okay, let's see, how can we do this? (laughs) This is a little bit more fun because you've gone through, okay, so the first thing is you should never be talking about salary before you get a job offer. I always equate this to like dating someone. If this is the first date and you just met me, Stop asking me all my personal business. Don't ask me how much money I want to make with your company. Don't ask me how much I make. Like, get out of my business. I don't know you like that. That's how I like to think about it. All right. I want to interject, but what about the companies who ask you up front how much you currently make? I feel like they ask you that usually first, right? They do. There's good news that there are some laws. So in New York City, the, initially the law was for public employees. They no longer could be asked that question. Now they've expanded that to even private employees in New York. And I think Massachusetts is the other state. 
It's not everywhere yet. So good news is that some states are starting to ban that question just because they don't want to perpetuate the gender wage gap and all of that. But that's good news. So you can decline to answer. But for the other states that you can still ask that. So there's two questions they ask. The first question is, how much are you currently making? Now, it's up to you whether you want to disclose that or not. You can say, like, say you're making 50000 You can say, I'm currently making 50000 However, I know that I'm currently being underpaid based on market research, so I'm sure that the next opportunity that I would get would be somewhere higher than that. So that's a way to kind of answer it, but, but letting it, setting the stage that you're not, you're looking for more than that. Or you can decline to answer. There are some people who just say, you know, don't really want to talk about that yet. It's kind of early in the stage. I'm not comfortable speaking about that. And if they push, you can, you can just repeat yourself again. When I'm coaching people, I don't think you should push back more than twice. So if they ask you once, you kind of say no. If they ask you again, you kind of say no. That third time, just answer. You don't want to like agitate the situation. And the second question is, how much are you expecting? And that's the more common question that people ask. So what are your salary expectations? And this one, you can definitely get away with not answering. I like to tell people that you should say something to the effect of, it's kind of early in the process. There's so many things at stake here. I'm not really ready to answer that question yet. So really just try to keep it vague with them and not give a number because like it or not, the person who says the number first, they lose. You want them to give you their number first and you should be waiting until they put a ring on it, which is giving you that offer. Like (laughs) show me that you love me, show me that you want me. And then we can talk about personal information. So you really should wait as far into the process as possible to do that. And you know, you can just tell them not ready to answer you yet. We'll talk through it. And I coach people through this process. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. Yes, it is. But they expect you to negotiate. Like 83% of employers expect negotiation. So you're not doing anything that is so out, unheard of and out of the ordinary. So you really, you really need to ask for more during that whole process. Okay. Now, earlier you said that you increased your salary by 25000 was mm-hmm. it, from one job to the next? Yes. Can you, if you can give like an abridged version of how you were able to mm-hmm. do that, like that process? I followed exactly what I'm talking about now. So even with when it started with, so this company found me on LinkedIn, they reached out, they told me that they have an open job. So I'm already starting kind of at a leg up. I wasn't looking, I was perfectly fine where I was. They reached out to me and we went through the process. They're definitely a top notch company and with their recruiting habits and all of this. So they didn't ask me what my expectations were. They didn't ask me how much I make because I think certain companies get it. Like this is not important. You're paying for talent. You're not trying to low ball people. So they didn't ask me. Had they asked me though, I already have my script. I'm not ready to talk about this. Let's get through the process. So as we got through the process and it got to the negotiation after, you know, I got my offer and they say, we want to, we would like to offer you this money. I don't even remember what the original offer was, but they gave me the offer. And then always, I never give a response right then and there. You always want to tell them you need to sleep on it for many reasons. One, because you want them to think, you know, I'm not that desperate. I'll get back to you. But two, because you also do want to come back with your strategy. You don't want to just jump into this conversation and who knows what you're liable to say, you know, so you want to just take some time. So I took some time, a couple of days, went back to them and I said, you know, really excited about this offer. Thank you so much for considering me. Really enjoyed the process. I know that I will do well here. This number is actually what I'm looking for is there any wiggle room? You know, how can we bridge the gap between what you're offering and what I'm ready to have? And so we kind of just talked through the offer. There were some other pieces of the negotiation pie that I talked about as well, like, you know, scheduling and stuff like that. We worked through it until we got to a place where we were both comfortable. And the thing is that I never give, you never give like a concrete number. You always give a range. You want to make them feel like they have some control. You don't want to give people ultimatums. You don't want to put them into a box. You really want, you know, them to feel like they have control in the process. So we were able to get it done. Very happy with the outcome. And, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Yes. You mentioned LinkedIn. Mm Mm-hmm. And how you were able to basically almost, you get, you got that offer or the initial conversation and contact from LinkedIn. Can you explain like why LinkedIn matters and how you use it to land jobs in your sleep? Because seriously, (laughs) I feel like I hear from you (laughs) often like, oh, I have like companies contacting me for legit interviews. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty important in the process, isn't it? It's more than pretty important. I wish I could express through this podcast, like how much I'm obsessed with LinkedIn and how much it's a crucial part 
of your career, but especially of an active job search. So LinkedIn, for some reason, yeah, has a bad rap, not a bad rap, but just the reputation of being like the boring social media, it's stuffy and all of this. And okay, there's a level of that, but it's such a great way to connect with other professionals. It's a great way to connect with recruiters and hiring managers. And 97% of these recruiters are going on LinkedIn to vet candidates, to find candidates. Like this is what they do. There are people within recruiting teams called sourcers who their only job is to scour the internet to find people to reach out to. So you, your job as a job seeker is to make it as easy as possible for them to find you. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure you have an optimized LinkedIn account that is up to date, that has your photo, that shows what you're doing, that positions you as an expert, and really shows that you could potentially be a good fit. So the past two job offers that I received, and even just even more beyond that, just like inquiries I received for jobs have come directly from LinkedIn. I can't tell the last time I've gone on like Indeed or one of those jobs job boards to look for a job. They literally, it's funny you said find you in your sleep. But yeah, sometimes I wake up and someone from Google (laughs) in California has emailed me overnight about an open job. And it's really just about just positioning yourself to show that you, you know, you're about your business and that you would be someone interesting for them to talk to. So LinkedIn is crucial. What are like three quick wins that someone who does not have a presence on LinkedIn or has a page that's just not updated? What are three things they can do, two or three things that they can do right now today to get their profile up to date and ready? Three things. So yeah, so I had a client who had no LinkedIn page. He had nothing. And within 24 hours of us doing these things that I'm about to tell you, he had two recruiters in his inbox offering him jobs. And in three weeks, not offering jobs, like one and a half conversations. And within three weeks, he had three job offers. So the things that we tackled first was one, you got to get a nice headline up there. Like LinkedIn defaults to, so when you put in your information, it defaults to your title at your company. So let's say you're a project manager at Amazon. It'll say, Dorian, and the headline would say, project manager at Amazon. Like, that's so boring. That's so, that does nothing. So you want to have a headline that really talks about what you do, talks about the things that, you know, make you unique in that. And you don't have a lot of characters. You don't have a lot of space. So you have to be really creative what you're doing. But you want to put a headline that's more than just the status quo and what everyone is doing. That's critical. This is what, when recruiters are doing searches and they're looking for people, they say they have an open role. This is one of the things that pop up first. And if they put in a search, let's say again for that project manager, and they see hundreds of project managers, you want to pop out to them. So for example, my headline says, HR business partner and career coach specializing in strengths-based career development freelance writer. So I've packed in a few of the things that I do. If you're looking for an HR business partner, you'll find me in your search. If you're looking for a career coach, you'll find me. If you're looking for someone who does strengths-based coaching, you'll find me. Career development, you'll find me. Freelance writer, you'll find me. It's keyword rich and it's really, you know, just speaking to what it is that I specialize in. The next thing is your smiling face. You should have a picture. I'm tired of seeing people with LinkedIn profiles with just the gray silhouette. Please put a picture on your LinkedIn profile. People want to feel like they have a sense of who you are and there's no rule about how the picture should look and you should, should you be doing this? Should it be professional? I mean, should it be a, you know, a professional paid photo that you do? It doesn't have to be all that. Mine is literally a selfie. I was in my backyard, put on a sweater. I was hot as hell because it was summertime, but I had to, you know, can't be wearing a tank top. <laughs> um, but I did a selfie and smiling face. I just looked personable and it is what it is. It believe it, we're visual people. So you want to just have a photo that is professional, that is personable, and that really just makes you look inviting, not holding any drinks, not with any bikinis on, like really be comfortable, <laughs> be careful about what it is you're posting. And the third thing, you need to have a summary that it shows who you are as a professional. And people struggle with the summary because they're like, you know, it's a summary. I, should I be formal? I don't, you know, should I be boring? And I mean, you obviously are not, it's not a blog post. So you need to be careful. You don't need to like say, okay, so I grew up in, you know, a sunny, you don't have to do all of that, but just show yourself. Like I talk about what my goals are as an HR professional. I talk about some of the accomplishments I've made and, you know, you really just want to, show 
that you are a professional person, show that you have the experience, show that you have the potential. You want it to be keyword rich based on, you know, what the recruiters would be looking for. There's an art to it, but those are the, definitely the three things. So it's making sure that your headline is punchy, that it's out there, that they can see you, see what your skills are. Make sure you have a photo attached to your profile and make sure your summary really speaks to at the core who you are as a professional. No, those are really good tips. And I actually probably need to go look at my LinkedIn profile and <laughs> <laughs> do some of those things. Okay. So going back to income, right? Because income is a driving force. It's very important. You mentioned something that a lot of times people, you know, you can't go in demanding or wanting a certain salary if you are not a top performer, mm -hmm. right? So how does one become a top earner? I mean, we know it's by being a top performer, but how, what are just some quick things, quick wins that someone who maybe is not a top performer uh, or earner at the moment, what can they do? What can they go into the office tomorrow and change and do to put them on that path? So, yeah, so the first part step to being a top earner is to be that top performer. And so if you're not, then you need to figure out what you need to do to become that. So sit down with your boss, sit down with people who are top performers in your company, look at them, imitate them. What are they doing well? Are they missing deadlines? Are they, you know, how are they going above and beyond? You want to find someone to emulate and you want to speak to your manager to map out clear expectations about what it is you need to do to get to the next level. And then you need to do them. You need to, like, it's more than just talking. It's more than just planning. It's more than just thinking. Like there needs to come a point where you actually start executing. So you need to do your job, not just well, but above average. You need to be above and beyond. And then you need to start making your case known. No one can read your mind. No one knows you want a promotion. No one knows you want to raise. These are conversations that you need to have with your manager or HR or whoever it is in your company on a pretty regular basis. And not that you're going into their office every month or every week, but you know, schedule time like quarterly to sit down with the key decision makers to talk about these things, to talk about your performance. You've put together your plan, you're trying to work harder, make sure you're getting feedback that says, yes, this is what you've been doing. You've been doing well in these areas. This is where you need to pick it up. You don't want it to be a surprise when you get to your annual review that you weren't doing these things well for the past two quarters. And you know, this is why you're not getting promoted. You don't want that to be a surprise. You, wanna, you need to be the CEO of your own career and understand where you're falling short and how you can improve. And then you need to make your case known and everyone should know, everyone who matters, you know, who's in the decision-making process should know what your expectations are because they're not going to be able to read your mind. Right. Those are good points. And so just to transition a little bit, because yes, income is important. Finances are important, but there's something to be said for this elusive work life balance. Mm -hmm. So to be a top earner, you know, which means that technically you're a top performer, can you, or how can you do that, but then still maintain a work life balance so that you can enjoy life while you're on this journey to increasing your income? That's an amazing question. I think work-life balance is something that people, they really want. It's important. It's top of mind, especially, you know, as women, as, you know, parents, like this is something that people just really want. Work-life balance is really important to everyone. So you really need to decide like what is most important to you because even my, with, if I take my own career, my definition of work-life balance now as a wife and a mother is totally different from my definition of work-life balance when I first started working. I just wanted to be able to go to the club, you know, on Saturdays, <laughs> and go to happy hours on Thursdays and, and be able to wake up and function at work. That's what work-life balance was to me. I didn't care how many hours I needed to work. You know, I didn't care. Now, not so much. I have schedules and daycare pickups and recitals and all of that. So figure out what's important to you. Figure out what your non-negotiables are. What are things that you absolutely have to make time for? Do you need to go to the gym? Do you need to be able to get a mani petty? What things are important to you that you need to be able to infuse into your schedule and your life? Be realistic and know that it's a continuum. So it's not that, okay, as soon as you step in the house, that's it. Work is over. I can only focus on this. Or when I'm at work, nothing is going to interrupt that. Know that it's more about integration and not necessarily balance where this is, you know, I have my work hat on and then I have my home hat on. It just doesn't work that way in real life. So just be flexible. Know that sometimes when you're working on a project, you might spend more time in the office. You might miss some dinners. You may come home late, but know that when you're on vacation, you're not going to turn on your phone. And, you know, it's just a finding ways to, to have that balance. And then be open and transparent with 
your manager, with your coworkers, let people know. They know at my job that I need to leave at a certain time every day. I have a daughter that I need to pick up that with her events, I'm going to go. They know that on family vacations, you cannot reach me because I am on vacation. And my family knows that when I'm on the computer for this hour that's blocked out, I'm working. So it's just all about setting boundaries, setting expectations, being realistic with yourself, and really just being clear as far as what does work-life balance mean to you? What things do you need in your life to feel like you're, you know, in a good space? Excellent. Excellent tips. You know, this was a great, great just overview of increasing your income, ways to become a top earner, and then work-life balance. So I think that everyone, if you're listening, you should have got some really good tips here. So please, Dorian, tell us, tell my journeyers where they can find you if they want to learn more. Sure. You can find me at yourcareergirl.com. That is my website. There's a blog. I also have a podcast, Deeper Than Work, where we talk about all things career. I'm on social media as Your Career Girl everywhere except for Twitter because they wouldn't let me be great. So it's Your Career Girl underscore for Twitter. That's where you can find me. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dorian, for coming on. Thank you. Wow, guys, I really hope that you got a lot from that episode with Dorian St. Floor of Your Career Girl. As always, if you want to find the episode show notes, you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode seven. I know for me, I got some interesting tidbits on how to approach my manager if I felt the need to ask for a raise. Dorian gave some really good speaking points and talking points on what to actually say and how to approach a conversation. So I hope you got that too from the episode. And again, if you like what you're hearing, share it with a friend. Don't be greedy now. Let a friend know (laughs) all the things that you're learning. Share it with them so that you guys can level up together. Like I promised, I want to read another review that I got on iTunes from the podcast. This one is from fit underscore prof. I'm sure that's probably short for professor. So he says, or she, Jamila provides a fresh take on the boring topic of personal finance. It's inspiring to hear someone's wealth building strategy without the assistance of an inheritance or life insurance. And the advice is practical and doable. I look forward to to more. Wow. Thanks, Fit Professor. I really appreciate that. I mean, these reviews really, really, every time I log in and I see that something has been updated and I've gotten another rating or review, it really, really motivates me to keep going, to keep producing this content for you. So if you really do like what I'm doing and you want to show me some support and you're listening in iTunes, please go review, rate, and subscribe in iTunes. And let's not forget, even if you're not listening in iTunes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Let's not forget that. So Android users, there's a link in the show notes for you to use and to subscribe to the podcast that way. If you want to listen into Stitcher or SoundCloud, you can do it there too. I can't wait to reconnect with you next week. Stay tuned.